So, Somber Talk's character, and it's mostly because I have no character. I have no identity whatsoever. Also, I am horrible at PowerPoint, life in general, moving very long, and I am committing the deadly sin of reading my PowerPoint. Stop it! Apologies. So, the first thing that uh, comes to mind is why are characters important to a story, and uh, which should take priority, the story or the character? And an analogy that I like to use is taking a trip. Okay, the story is the trip itself. The plot is the road that you're on. The setting is what you're seeing outside the windows, but the character are the people that you're taking the road trip with. And if you have taken a road trip with good friends, it is a wonderful, memorable experience that you cherish for years, if not the rest of your life. And if you take a long, long road trip with families and in-laws and their kids, it's friends stuffed in the back of a Suburban, 820 miles to go to Disneyland. It leaves scars. Don't do it. I speak from experience. So, the characters that we make are those people that we go through the story with. Um, they essentially are the people that keep us in the car rather than just simply ditching it and going to go do or read something else. Um, that said, that story is something that does need to take most importance. Um, mostly because nobody really wants to hear a character background for hours on end. They want to hear what is the character doing. So remember that a story is something happening. Um, our characters are just who they happen to. Now, 99% of the time, it is story, they but occasionally... It, uh, the whole game genre. What's that? Oops, I need to do something. So I can take quote questions afterwards. But anyway, about the uh, 1% that is character first and uh, the story just kind of gets tacked on later, they generally work for Disney. Um, if you have a great idea for a character, a hero or a villain, or maybe you have a great take on an established character, um, try to think up of a really engaging story for that character to do rather than just, oh, this is an awesome cool character that really appeals to me but i have no idea what the story is that that, that they're in um one very common character problem is character is blank problem um but we'll get to that towards the end but it's something that you definitely see tacked on and it's uh something to learn to avoid so where do characters come from? Because a lot of people like to say, well, a character is a person, um, and they're not. Um, I am a person. You are all people. Um, we know many people in, in our lives, but they're not characters. Um, characters are simulations of a person because in my day today, I did many things that just honestly would bore, bore you to tears. So... If you were to write a story and you were to try to put me into that story, um, odds are it would be a fairly bit, uh, boring, plain story because generally as a person, I'm not that in that interesting. And most people aren't. Um, it's only with some very careful biographical editing that most people can bear to deal with, uh, to deal with them. So... Don't worry so much about your character being a realistic person. Worry about how does this character work in the story? Does this character, uh, you know, keep the reader engaged? Does the character forward the plot? Um, and how do they do that? Uh, it's much more important to focus on the final story than it is to focus on, well, or to worry about, oh, is this realistic or not realistic? Because the story really needs to come first. That's kind of why you're there. So. All right. So when you are building a character, built characters are made to order. Um, you might recall from last week where I was talking about a structured story versus a buy your seat or your pants story. Um, building a character is usually built for a specific story because you are planning the plot, 
you're planning the story, you're making the setting, you're arranging it all carefully. Um, so when you ever you build a character, you generally want to make that character as detailed as possible. Um, there are lists of questions that you can ask a, a, a character, like uh, what is that character's favorite color? Why? What was that character's most prized childhood possession? Why? What? Uh, which parent did the did, did the child uh, favor more? Um, they can prompt a lot of questions for your character that can lead to a, a more realistic or dynamic uh, simile to engage the story. Um, not every character detail is is going to be essential for that character. In fact, many aren't. But it's important that as a writer, you know what does and doesn't go into the story. Okay? So don't worry so much um, if you are doing one of these lists where you're where you're making a character um, and you, you have a blank. You're like, I, I, just, I just don't know. But highlight it. Think about, well, is this something, this this thing I don't know, something that I need for my story, or is it just good for me to uh, ignore it and move on? Uh, a question that is a favorite of mine um, that I like to put to students is, what would your character eat for breakfast? Uh, that is actually a very telling thing, because what we eat says a lot about our social status, our economics, our values, our time, our health. Um, who we live with, in, is it something that's an involved family ritual, or is it a very personal thing, or is it something that's skipped altogether, and in that case, why? These are, are very telling moments for a character that you can use when you're building that character, even if you never actually show it in the story. Oh, come on. Okay, so growing a character is a slightly is essentially the uh, opposite. You start with a character. Um, the character doesn't have to be very well well developed. You have to have a general concept and the story that they are involved in. But you put the character in a situation and they just go. And as they go, you just start at the beginning of their life and you start filling in what are some of the things that happen during the course of their life that leads to uh, where they start to appear in the story. Um, I like to do this chronologically and think about what actually happened to Blackjack when she was five years old. Um, the answers may astound you. They would probably astound me because I don't think I've ever written Blackjack when she was five years old. But when you do have these life events and you're writing your story, all of a sudden you may think, wait a minute, the character had something happen in their past that will relate to this now, it would be really good for me to address it. Okay, so whenever you are growing a character, you have to remember all the little nitty gritty details. It's really good to write it down in a book um, or some notes so that you can easily just go back and reference it if you can't straight. Um, that's the other way of really kind of, kind of creating a character is you just start with a beginning and then you just go to whatever. All right. So character description. And this is something that I have a lot of folks talk about when they say, how should I handle my character description? Um, and one of the worst ways that you can possibly do it is have a paragraph or two detailing every single bit of the character for the reader. Um, now, these, these description blocks, these, these exposition blocks, um, one problem is, is that usually there is so much information, the reader cannot absorb what is important and what isn't. Um, secondly, it slows down the reading to a crawl. Uh, and once you slow down, you then have to go on as well. Um, pick pick things back up so that the story is rolling back along again. Um, the opposite problem, though, that, that some readers will do is they will not have any description whatsoever. They will essentially have I, and it will be the character thinking things, even the character doing things, but we will have no idea what this person uh, looks like. 
Um, occasionally, that is deliberate. If you happen to write in the second person, um, there's a fine art to writing in the second person. I do not have it, but um, if you are writing in the second person, very frequently, uh, the lack of character description will be deliberate in order to let the reader uh, more intimately insert themselves into that second person narrative. Um, but otherwise, you, we, the reader is going to need some kind of imagery to latch upon. And you're kind of selling yourself short on um, indirect characterization by not having any description whatsoever. So when you're going through and you're piling on and, and either building your character from, from 300 questions or you're just growing your character, um, try to think about how you can convey it in small chunks and if you actually read Harry Potter, they don't give paragraph or Rowling doesn't give paragraphs of description at the outset. Instead, it's a scar on the forehead. Okay, the most important physical description is given back when Harry was a baby, that he has a scar on his forehead, and this scar is going to be a very important element of his character from that point on in chapter one. All the way to his to, to when he's he's uh, the end of the story series. Okay, so it's pretty clear why that is one of the very first things that is given to us. Um, later on, we're told, oh, he has brown hair. Okay, he has uh, his mother's eyes. Um, we're told that he's short and weedy compared to his cousin. That's about it. We don't get a lot of other descriptions like you know what what kind of a haircut does he have. Um, we're told that his his glasses have been taped. Um, all of these small descriptions allow us to paint a picture of what Harry looks like, but also what has happened in his life to get him to this point. Oh, come on. All right. So when you be talking about character backgrounds, there are some people that hate character backgrounds, and there are some people that have pages and pages of character background. And if you ask them about it, they will tell you the pages and pages of character background, and you know who you are. Um, character background is critical for the author to know. It's not always critical for the reader to know. Um, the reason is, like what I was saying when you're growing a character, Things will occur in the story, and it's important that the author knows what's happened in the character's past so that they can react or act accordingly for what's going on in the story. Okay? So none of us, you know, came to our adulthood, you know, just out of a box. We all underwent things growing up that shape who, are, who we are for good things and bad things. Okay, so when you're thinking of your character, one thing that a lot of people will talk about is, oh, you know, you have to give your character flaws. You, you cannot have this, this absolutely perfect background uh, exist. Well, you can if it's vital to your story. Like if it's important that your character has a happy childhood where nothing wrong happens, that fine. Go ahead and do that. Um, a lot of people, though, um, think, oh, I'm going to make my character, uh, ungainly or clumsy or something because I don't want the character to be, be perfect. These are what I like to call inherent flaws, where essentially just they're tacked onto the character. Um, the other is, would be an opposed flaw, where... Uh, there is something about the character that is essentially stopping them from getting what they want in the in the story. Okay, um, this can be something like skin color. This can be something like uh, a a religion. This can be something like a orientation. Um, things that cause problems in life lead to conflict, and conflict is usually very good for a story. Whereas if you just say, well, I, I'm clumsy and I, you know, trip a lot or I, you know, uh, uh, have bad acne, it's like, well, okay, yeah, technically I suppose that's a flaw, but 
it's not really all that critical. Um, now, occasionally, sometimes you have characters that go f much further than the happy childhood, and they ha simply have flaw after flaw after flaw after flaw. Um, I like to call these the hot mess. Uh, and occasionally, you can have a character that's so loaded with flaws um, that the reader will have a hard time relating to the character. It's like, okay, so this horrible thing happened to you, and this horrible thing happened to you, and this... I, I have trouble imagining a character handling one of those, let alone seven or eight. Um, so you want to be kind of careful with your character's background, what's happened and what hasn't. Um, and it's always good to kind of think of what was the very best thing that happened to your character and what is the most worst thing that has happened to your character. And that can kind of help you gauge, you know, how your character has developed as they've... Uh, Next. All right. Character psychology, a.k.a. what is going on in your character's head. Um, so there's a, a motto by Vonnegut that everyone wants something, even if it's just a glass of water. You need to know why your character wants what they want. Um, because that want is motivation, and it is essentially the reason why your character is going through the story. Um, it is usually something that develops from the, the character's background. Uh, events in their past, things that they want, things that have happened to them that shape the things that they need. Um, and essentially what a person wants is then going to come in conflict with what they can do or what they can get. Uh, a character that can do everything, that can get anything that they want is usually not really all that interesting unless there's some really clever twist on how it happens. Um, essentially, when we know that the character is always going to be competent and able to overcome everything, you kind of know how the story is going to end, don't you? Um, so it really helps for you to think about your character, think about what's happened in their background, uh, to think about what it is that really drives that character to their goal. Um, there is a psychological, uh, I'm not sure if it's so much of a theory, um, but it's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And it's a tiered set of, of things that an individual needs to have in order to be a more stable and active individual. And it starts off with basic survival. Like if you don't have the basics for survival, um, you're not going to worry about your love life. You're going to worry about, am I going to live in the next five minutes or not? Beyond that, it's things like shelter. And then once you have that, you start looking at things like needing family and friends. Above that, it's actual, you know, psychological and economic stability and if you ever look at the hierarchy of needs um, you can look at your character and kind of figure where on this hierarchy is my character um, do they have the basics of survival or have they everything in their life they need to become god emperor of the universe um, it's a good way to kind of gauge psychologically where your character might be All right, so w there's character development and there's character evolution. They are not one and the same. So evolution is a is a step by which a character or by which an organism changes uh, over many generations uh, to better suit their environment. And characters do the same thing as well. If you have a character that you know very well, and you know the story that they're in, you can anticipate how the story is going to shape the character and how the character is going to shape the story. Um, now, sometimes your character will not be a good fit for your story. And you're going to have to decide, you know, either showing the character evolving over the course of the story, or you may have to change the character. Okay. Um, 
Sometimes this can go on for months as you cycle an idea trying to get the character to fit the story only to realize that it's just not the right character seen in the story. Um, other times you can change the character. So uh, one natural or, or one example if you if folks have read Horizons is I had Blackjack wandering around the wasteland and they come across a bunch of kids. The kids warn Blackjack, do not take anything from these bones because otherwise monsters will come. And the plot I had planned is, okay, Blackjack's going to follow the kids and she is going to, you know, move on to Mega Mart and learn all the things she needs to learn. But then I thought, wait a minute. Blackjack is older than these kids. Blackjack would think that she is smarter than these kids. And Blackjack would then do what she thought was right. And she's like, well, I need bullets. I'm going to pull something. And all of a sudden, my whole plot goes out the window. Um, this was an evolution. I did not honestly plan on Blackjack doing those things. I planned her growth of going differently. But I realized that over the course of just the first few chapters, um, she evolved on me. Where it's like she's not someone that's just going to automatically listen and do what people say. Okay, She's a bit of an idiot. She's going to make poor choices. She's going to be someone impulsive. And she does. And there's consequences for that, which then shape her further. That leads to what we call character development. <clears throat> so, character development is essentially how the character changes and how the reader is invested and involved in the character. Okay? Um... A character that is the same at the end of the story as they are at the beginning of the story is what's typically called a flat character. Okay, A character that is different at the end of the story will have changed the reader over the course of reading it. Okay, Hopefully, it will be a good change. The reader will finish the story, and they will feel like something in them has been fulfilled by finishing the story with you. Um, the character's journey becomes their own journey in uh, certain ways. Um, so it's really important to think about where is this character going and how do I want this character to end? Um, and be very aware, your character may evolve in ways that are completely contrary to how you plan on developing them. Um, and it's a challenge. Sometimes you have to force the character to follow the plot. The reader may not – the reader may notice, and the reader may not like it. Other times, you may let the character be the character, and suddenly the reader will, will be like, well, this story is wandering. I'm not quite sure where it's going. Um, it's a challenge, and there is no perfect answer. It would be nice to say, you know, have 100 percent of the character development planned ahead of time. Uh, I would be happy to have 50 percent, honestly. I kind of know where I want everyone to end up. I don't know if they're all going to get there. Um, so yeah, it kind of it kind of depends on how you write and where you want it all to end up. Oop. All right. So shoot. Uh, so as I was saying earlier about uh, uh, character development, flat characters are essentially characters where they start the story, they do a bunch of things, and they end up. And when they end up, they're pretty much the same character. Um, very little has fundamentally changed with them. If uh, um, you have watched the series Steven Universe Future, um, this is a major criticism of the protagonist that when it's all done – um, he's fundamentally the same person as he was when he started. Uh, there has been no real critical change in the way that he deals with life or in the, or in the character uh, Stephen himself. So even though a character can go through a lot of stuff, do a lot of things, have a lot of things happen to them, um, 
you have to think about what has changed in the character. And if you can't answer that, you might want to rethink about how your character is interacting with your story. Some care, some readers will be fine with it. They're there for something else. They're not there for the character. They're there for the setting. They're there for the plot. They like the world. Um, others, though, will be like, what did I waste my time on? Um, so it is something to keep in mind is that is this character, where is this character going over the course of the story? Or are they simply just, you know, there for the story to happen around? Yeah, sorry, Piper. Okay, so how many folks have feared writing the dreaded Mary Sue? I know I have. Um, I get asked this a lot about how do I avoid my character being a Mary Sue? And here's the, the, the problem with the term Mary Sue is that it is not a criticism. It is a label. Um, it's essentially bad criticism. So if someone is ever throws the word Mary Sue at you, your character is a Mary Sue, or your character is overpowered, which we're going to get to, um, what that means is that they do not feel like giving you the amount of criticism necessary to justify that statement. Um, now, if they tell you why they think that it is a Mary Sue, and they give you and they give you specific reasons why they Mary Sue, um, then you should probably listen a little bit closer. But don't be afraid of Mary Sue; it is simply a person's opinion. Um, a poorly written character can always be. Now, what are some things that will generally get your character labeled a Mary Sue? Um, they are generally characters that lack conflict. Uh, these are the characters that essentially have their everything together. They have the resources they need. They don't face significant opposition, and they essentially can do what they want. Um, and the story essentially exists to show them doing what they want. Um, it's something that, you know, characters start or writers starting out um, will freak don't know the character. So they'll just insert themselves into the story. Well, I would want this, and I would want that, and since I control everything, I shouldn't. I it's the writer. Um, don't be terrified of of writing a Mary Sue. Just be aware it can happen, and because it's not the end of the. Just get specific feedback. Ask them, why do you think this about my character? What do you think? You know, you can fix that. Okay, it's not the end of the world that you write a Mary Sue. Now, I've had some people are, accuse me of having Blackjack at the end of Horizons being a Mary Sue. Um, and I will point out that at the very end, she's dealing with an undead star god. Sorry, I think that that's a, a, a significant enough conflict. I hope, at least. But um, in the end, I can't control what other people uh, how other people feel about my character. So all I can do is try to write the best character that I can write. Oh, not Russian. I like I'm going past. Oh, that's questions. Come on. Yeah. Taking good time. Yeah, questions are always good. All right, the last bit. Overpowered. Your character is overpowered with unlimited power. Guess what? It's fine to have a powerful a powerful character if the power makes sense. If the power uh, fits into the story, fits into the setting, these are fine, okay? Superman is an incredibly powerful character, but depending on how the writer writes him, um, it can either be a great driver of drama, or it can be just a hot mess, uh, where you're like, yeah, it's Superman, I know he's going to win. Um, so when you have a powerful character, you need to think back to that character development and ask, how did they get this power? Does this power make things easier for them, or does it make things harder for them? Because very frequently, having power doesn't make your life easier. Very often, having power can just complicate your life in a new way. 
the new way is something that can be easy, that can be interesting to a reader that's not used to, to things like that. Um, if on the other hand, oh, I am powerful and can solve the problem with the snap of my fingers, well, mm, it's not going to be that all that engaging. Now, it's still possible. There is an anime called One Punch Man. Um, I highly recommend it because the character is, in case you... Spoiler alert, I suppose. Um, the character can defeat any enemy with one punch. Um, and he faces just monsters after stronger monsters after galactic monsters, and he defeats them all with one punch. Um, and so even the very final penul or ultimate you know, boss in the first episode, he fights, and it is – he essentially beats him. And the character Saitama says, I, that was a good fight. And the guy he just beat went, you could have mopped the floor at me with any single time. You're lying. That's what makes the character of the show actually work is because he wants this good, this good fight, but he's so overpowered. He will never have a satisfactory battle. And all of the ways that he is heroism is, um, is overlooked by other people kind of becomes the, the question of the character. You never question, will he win or lose the fight? Of course he's going to win the fight. The question now the reader has is, well, is he going to be happy as a result of this? And the answer is usually eh, not really. Okay. Browse. Next. Almost done. Almost the questions. I swear. Okay, the blank character, a.k.a. the token character. So sometimes you're filling out that 300, and you'll see a portion that says religion, and you'll go uh, Jewish because for whatever reason, you wanted to put a different kind of, of religion in there, or they're Hispanic, or they're homosexual, and you don't put any thought into how this actually affects the character. This is the blank character. <clears throat> and so it generally happens when a, a reader is trying to make a character quote-unquote realistic or diversified without really thinking through the implications of how does it matter to the story. Um, frequently it doesn't. Uh, the the attribute is simply just something there for the reader to identify with some description and just move on because the story doesn't center on their ethnicity or their sexuality or their gender or anything like that. But if you do uh, uh, pick these kinds of, of characteristics and you present them in your story, it's always good to think about how is this something that I can show as mattering in the story. Otherwise, it just feels like you're playing tokenism. Okay. So I'm sure that everyone has read Marvel Comics where they have the blank character that is um, whatever quote-unquote diversity they're interested in promoting. Very frequently, the stories they have involved don't really engage the character on that level very well. Okay, so try to make sure that if your character has a characteristic, that it matters. Okay, that is enough. So, uh, this would be the time to ask questions. Um, you can type them in the chat. Actually, it would actually be easier to type them in the chat because uh, it's kind of hard to hear who says things. Oh, um, I was actually, because I have a lot of stuff and most of them aren't really questions they're more like statements and asides well, and all that well, let's do a round round of questions first um okay. so uh questions about characters about the characters you're right okay procrastination deadlines deadlines sir um one thing that uh, uh i actually did was i handed over a dollar for every day that I was late. Um, 
for a chapter back when I was starting out uh, Project Horizons. Um, it's something that I honestly, honestly should go back to. But uh, I, I gave one of my editors money every time I, I slipped on a deadline, and it taught me how to keep it up. Um, it's a challenge. It's simply getting the discipline of writing every single day for a period of time, making sure people in your life know, don't ask me to play a game, don't send me a cat gif, don't bug me from the hours of 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. because I'm doing writing. Send it to me afterwards. And often it means turning off Discord, um, which I have found is something I need to do every time I try to write because otherwise I will be distracted by that little icon lighting up. Okay. Uh, yes, many people harass me. Unfortunately, what my I'm I'm simply learning to um to just get used to saying I suck and not actually writing, so sigh. Advice on building a diverse five and dan character, how to give someone a, a different culture justice. All right. So when you have uh, inter-character dynamics, you have to kind of think about um, if you're going to play to archetypes or not. Um, there are certain arrangements of characters that uh, uh, are very appealing to a reader. Um, if you have two characters, it's essentially a black and white. One character compares and contrasts off the other uh, the other character will usually be called a either a lancer or a shadow of the protagonist, and they essentially exist to kind of needle the, the protagonist. Um, in uh, Dante's Inferno, it's Virgil, it is a shadow of the main character. Um, three characters, you have uh, Brains, Brawn, and Beauty. Um, you have, or you can have an arrangement of id, ego, and super ego. Um, and these essentially allow the, the reader to easily differentiate, you know, okay, here's character A, they're the smart one. Here's character B, they're the pretty one. Here's character C, they're the smart one. Um, I can keep these characters straight and I can make predictions about how they are going to be acting and interacting. Um... Four, you start entering, you get to the four uh, uh, attitudes, or sorry, um, um, what are they called? Humors. Um, philemic, choleric, uh, sanguine, love the word. And one more, I think it's supine. Um, but uh, these are essentially attitudes where you have like the excitable ganky girl, the quiet shy one, um, you know the uh, the boisterous bruiser, and then the angry brooding one. Uh, another way of looking at it is four elements: fire, water, wind, earth. Um, another way of uh, looking at it also, well, four horsemen of death would actually be kind of out there, wouldn't it? Um, five man band though is, is one that's very popular because you have the hero at the center and then you have the other elements surrounding it. So it essentially allows the hero to become more of the everyman role because this way there are heroes or other characters that can be specialists so that the hero doesn't seem too good. Um, and the famous five man band is the emotional one, the intellectual one, the physically bruiser, the physical bruiser best friend slash back um again i myself used a five man band quite deliberately you know p21 uh, uh was the rampage was the brute glory was the intellectual with kune was the emotional uh, support and blackjack was essentially the the one that was in the hero um it's challenging but it is something that can be valuable to consider. Once you start getting a past five, you start getting into some really kind of hard to follow and take follow all of the characters. Game of Thrones kind of had this. Game of Thrones never really focused on more than 
uh, at a time. Um, there's some series, though, that just goes completely nuts. Um, the uh, Wheel of Time series by Jordan. Just, whoo! Okay, there's lots of characters in this, I can tell. Um, now, how... On... Huh? Question on Twitch, I sent it to you. Okay. Let's go ahead and do the Twitch question. Um... I once wrote a character who was devoted to Celestia to the point of completely disregarding his own need, throwing himself into his near death repeatedly for her. How do you feel about these characters? Um, congratulations, you met Blackjack. So, when you're writing, there are things called tropes. Tropes are essentially literary tools that are familiar to a reader. Um, so when you have a character that is self-sacrificing, um, my question would be, why are they so self? Or why are they so self-sacrificing? Um, if it's simply because they love Luna, or sorry, if they love Celestia and love Celestia because Celestia is awesome, well, great. I'm not really going to care that much about them unless you really sell me so that I love Celestia as much as they love Celestia. Um, if on the other hand, you know, this character has been trying, struggling to prove themselves to the royal guard, and this is their one, and like everyone thinks they're a screw-up, and this is the one moment where Celestia was attacked, and they're the only person that is there to save Celestia, and they make this pull. That can be very powerful. Um, so it really depends on how you build up and present the character. If you just simply say they are this way because they are this way, then I'm going to say, great, I don't really care. probably move on from there. If you show me why they care, if you make me care as much as they care, I'm going to be a lot more invested in what happens to them. Uh, let's see here. Is there any sort of good technique or framework behind growing, changing a character throughout a story? Um, practice. I know, that's not a very satisfactory answer. So, you kind of have to occasionally ask yourself, does this make sense? Um, especially, does it make sense in the context of the story? Or is this something that I am forcing on the character to advance a plot point? Um, Many people, if you watch the last Game of Thrones, uh, Daenerys in the last season decides, I'm just going to incinerate a lot of women and kids. Now, I won't argue that that was out of character for her, but it was so rapidly forced onto the audience that it left it feeling like, well, great. I'm not thinking about, oh, what did Danny just do? I thought, oh, that's really crappy writing, and I'm no longer invested in the story. So... You kind of have to to think about how much a character can change, how much are you showing a character changing, um, and does the evolution make sense, or is it something that's been that's being forced on it by you, sense of your story. Uh, he sent me a follow up for context message for you. So. For context, the character was basically born into the service of Celestia as needed to perform extremely dangerous tasks for her to keep Ponykind safe. He literally doesn't know any other life but this constant hardship, and he feels he owes his very existence to Celestia. Um, wow, he needs to go to a therapist. Uh, if he is simply this, um, if he's just simply this, this devoted character that is focused on just this one thing, um, I don't feel very much conflict from him uh, because essentially all of his conflicts orient around, you know, serving Celestia and his existence being owed to Celestia. I, I honestly would question if Celestia herself would tolerate, you know, him abusing himself this way. Um, when you have a character that is that is sort of mono-motivated, where they only care about one singular thing to the point of obsession. Um, it can be kind of difficult for the character, for the reader, to go along with the... You... Most people want more than one thing. Like, I want to pay my rent. I also want to play with my dog. I also, you know, 
mom. I also care about my friends. And so I have a lot of different motivations deciding, inf informing what it is that I'm going to do. Um, if I just cared about my dog to the point where I ignored my rent, my friends, and my family, uh, most people would be pretty concerned by that motivation. So, uh, and ironically, that's actually, you know, a, a, a problem with, uh, with drug abuse. Uh, as a, a character becomes motivated simply by one simple thing to the detriment of all others. So I would, for in that example, I would definitely try to flesh that character out. Um, give them some other conflicts besides I, uh, this is my life and it's only my life. Honestly, I would love to see this this character be fired, um, and see how they and see how they deal with it. Like, oh, I've I, you've devoted twenty five years of your life to serving Celestia and saving Celestia. Um, here's your gold wash. You're retired. Have a nice day. And now it's like, now what the heck do I do with my life? Um. So yeah, uh, be 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 careful about you know mono motivated characters. Uh, they can be very intense, but they can also be really difficult for the character to follow along. Let's see here. Would you say that the episode of Celestia and Luna getting their cutie mark switch is a good example of a strong character's weakness and growth arc? Or is it more of a lighter type? Uh, that is a strong, uh, that is a very good, good example of... Uh, the character's weaknesses. If they had just shown Celestia and Luna swapping cutie marks and having difficulties, um, that would have been, you know, a, a, a light kind of fluffy episode where, oh, gee, yeah, your life is so hard. But when they actually show that, you know, uh, Celestia has Daybreaker and the idea that, that, that Celestia herself could become a nightmare every bit as bad or worse than Nightmare Moon. Um, it, to me, was a very telling moment of character for Celestia. Um, especially when she says, again. Um, I, I, I know that that was probably not the show's main thrust, but it implies that Celestia herself knows that she has these impulses inside her. <coughs> So that was an excellent use of, of uh, hinting at a character's internal flaws without its without saying, oh yeah, from time to time, Celestia has been really frustrated too, like Luna was when she when she became Nightmare Man. Um, what is the best way to handle a story where the bad guy is the protagonist? Same same way, same deal. Um, you go through the same process, either. Build the character to be a, a villain protagonist, um, which is a art form all in its own. Um, or you have to grow that character and be really critical about how they became a villain. Because here's the thing to remember. With it, almost no villain actually thinks of the actually thinks of themselves as a villain. And if they do, they only think of themselves as a villain to mock someone who is their who is their opposition. It's very rare uh, for someone to say, "Yeah, I'm bad, and I don't care, and I'm going to be bad." Most people become villains because they want something and are willing to accept harm to other people, um, regardless of the consequences. And a lot of villainy can be looked at with um, what is the character, the villain, willing to lose, willing to harm in order to get what they want? And is it justified? With a villain protagonist, it's really tough because you have to sell the audience that the villainy is somehow justified, at least to the villain themselves. Like, it can be completely screwed up. But if there is some way that the – see, this is why this villain and does they can follow along. Some of them will even root for the villain if the villain has to come extreme adversity to get what they want, and the reader feels like, hey, yeah, this is completely justified. 
Um, the Count of Monte Cristo is a great example of a story that has a, a technical uh, villain protagonist. Well, maybe not villain protagonist, but boy, is he dark. Um, but who is so obsessed with you know doing this, these things on getting revenge that the reader's just swept along. And by the end, the reader's like, oh, yeah, this guy who had his life wronged is, wow, he's doing a lot of things to these other people. Ouch. Um, so, yeah, it's, it requires even more care than a heroic, uh, a heroic character because you have to somehow get the reader on board with what he's doing. And it's, it's tough. It's extremely tough. Uh, you have another question from Twitch. I sent it to you. Okay. About mysterious characters whose real motivation is hard to read, what is an enjoyable balance? You have to show that there is motivation. Um, you don't have to tell us what it is. You don't have to tell us why it exists, but we do need to see see something driving the character. Um, and it helps if we have some clue of what it's about. If you just have a character that is showing up and doing stuff, um, the reader will very quickly start to ask what the hell is going on. And if you know what you're doing as a writer. Um, you definitely want to make sure that when you use a character like this, it is deliberate, that you know what the motivations are, and that their actions will make sense when the reader learns what the motivations are. And it's, again, a really tough thing to do when you're dealing with um, a protagonist, but you're trying to keep things hidden from the reader. In that case, you might be looking at an unreliable protagonist, uh, where what they tell the reader may or may not necessarily be true. Your ledger main is a really good example of that, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, um, white hooves? Or, sorry, light, uh, light, uh, light hooves? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the guy ultimately, his, his motivations are layered one on top of another. And Blackjack just strips them away one after the other. Till finally, he, she's just like, yes, your ancestor did really, really, really shitty things. Please stop trying to kill everybody because of it. It's not going to fix it. Um, you know, and, 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 and ultimately, you know, a lot of his, his motivations just collapses into a house of cards at the very end. But, you know, she has a mega spell, so things happen. All right. Best way to handle characters. Also, the best way to handle characters meeting alternate versions of themselves. Uh, you have to think about where did the character diverge. This is looking at their past, seeing where things split up and where everything uh, occurred. Um, and then you kind of have to think about the motivations of each character. Which motivation is stronger than the other? Which character is more willing to go, you know, the extra distance to get what they want? Um, are there ways for their motivation to work together, or is are they essentially doomed to conflict? Uh, lots of, you know, juicy, drum, uh, dramatic uh, conflict possible there. Um, they talked about villain protagonists. Ignore the comment about him being a male from Blackjack Stable. It was talking about the Celestia dude. No worries. Uh, how can a character evolve by changing physical traits? So one of the, the most basic physical changes that occurs to a character is growing old. It's aging. It's maturing. Um, as people grow older, uh, expectations in their life changes. Uh, what we want as children, we don't want as, ch as adolescents. What we wanted as adolescents, we generally don't want as adults. Um, and the obligations for each age is different. So just that simple physical change um, <clears throat> can uh, cause some uh, good character evolution. Another thing is, is that if they have life changes, if they suffer injuries, especially if they're permanent or debilitating. Um, 
if they undergo events in their life that are traumatic, they might have a psychological change on how they deal with stuff in the future. Uh, lots of ways that a, a character's physical um, traits can can kind of show the way that they are developing, especially if you show it as repetitive actions. You can show the way that the character is doing things are becoming a in, in parent to that character themselves. Okay, I hope I'm not rambling. I'm also dealing with acid reflux. I'm terribly sorry. <clears throat> oh no. Ooh. No, it's fine. It's fine. All right. Um, any other questions? Um. Okay. Wait, I'm, I'm gonna let anybody like else. Go if they have any more questions because I really, really want to get into this because I've been taking notes all through this session. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm taking tums like crazy. Minty. They're mentals. Okay. But the fruity ones are the best. Oh, steps. Um. Questions about writing or questions about uh, my writing? Okay, so I'd like to at least get workshopping done um, before we. Uh, you know, I do that if like nobody wants to workshop, then fine. I'll talk for another hour. But um, how many folks do have things that they would like to read and get feedback on? Uh, just put a one in.